Um, good. So we are in the we are in the series of sermons called the the power of one. Yeah, the power of one. Now it, this is a very short, uh, very short series of sermons, and uh, as 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 God is writing chapter two in the life of the church, it's very important for me to make sure that that we are united. You are united in, in God's vision. We are united in God's purpose. Whatever God has for us, there is power when we get united. There is power when the people of God get united for the same purpose, from the same goal. And, and soon you're gonna have a, we're going to have a special time, exciting times on the 10th of October. We will present the vision, we'll present the new direction uh, uh, that God has for us and, and uh, um, we, what kind of church we want to be. What kind of church we want to be for you? What kind of church we want to be for your family? What kind of church we want to be for this neighborhood? What kind of church we want to be for this city? What kind of church we want to be for this nation? What kind of church we want to be for this world? Because we want to, to, to have an impact in people's lives. And we have to be united for the same purpose, for the same goal. And that's the idea of this uh, short series of sermons, The Power of One. And last week, last, last week the, the text was based on the Tower of Babel. Yeah, we saw that what happens when people get together, you know, and, and that was, they, they had this, this wrongful desire to build something for themselves. And, and they got all together in unity, in one as, one, as one group, as one people, and they wanted to build something. So we saw that, that something powerful happens when, when people get uh, united. Um, and, and we see some, some of the results. Uh, what happens, and I use the word consequences, you know, my, my daughter kind of corrected me last week, I said, well, we don't use the word consequences, but I said, well, when it's something positive, then there's a positive consequences, right? So I was going to use the word results instead of that. I don't want to confuse my daughter anyway. So, uh, so but you know, some, uh, some results are happening when, when we are united. Building up the church is, is only possible through unity. Yeah? And, and God's blessing upon his church is only through unity. And, and the power of God is manifested in unity. And, and that is what I, want, uh, I would like to continue today uh, with, with this idea. The power of one. And... Um, and today's text, text is based on the prayer. Uh, it's, it's the prayer of Jesus. Now, everybody, when they think about the prayer of Jesus, they think about the, Lord, the Lord's prayer. But actually, the, the, there's a much more powerful prayer in John chapter 17 than we can say that actually that was the, the, the prayer that Jesus had for his disciples and for the world. So I want you to open your Bible in John chapter 17, and when you are there, say, I. John chapter 17. This is the New Testament. It's the fourth gospel. If it's not much uh, used to with the Bible, it's somewhere in the second book of the Bible, uh, John chapter 17. It's not first John. It's the, 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 it's the book of John. John chapter 17. Yeah? And that's the prayer of Jesus. So when you're there, say I. Yeah? John 17. You're going to have the words on the screen. I'm reading from New Living Translation, but feel free to read in your own translation, your Bible. And it's very important to make notes, to, to underline the words, the, the thoughts that God is speaking, through you, is speaking to you through, this, uh, through his word. John chapter 17 says like this. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to, to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name, now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united just as we are united. 
During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in the world so they will be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as do not belong to this world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you send me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will, be, they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want this whom you have given me to be with me where I am. They, then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Amen? Amen. Amen. On the 1st of May, 1707, the Kingdom of Great Britain was formed. The result of uh, acts of union being passed by the Parliament of England and Scotland to ratify the 1707 Treaty of Union and so united these two kingdoms. The term United Kingdom became official in 1801. A bit of history, by the way, for free. Like I said, you don't have to go to school. If you come to church, you get everything for free. So in 1801, the term United Kingdom became officially when the Parliament of the Great Britain and Ireland each passed an act of union uniting these two kingdoms and created the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. United Kingdom. And ever since, this island is called United Kingdom. United in so many things, in language, in culture, in history, religion, and so on. Today, this unity is in jeopardy. When people get together unified, there is a great power. Look what happens when, when people get united for a purpose. If you are on social media, you can see on Facebook, you can see on everywhere how easy it is to get people together to be united for, or for a strike, for example, for one purpose. They are united for one purpose and they get, when they get together, they are power. They can, turn, they can turn upside down governments because of their unity. Their wrongful desire, wrongful unity, but there is power in that unity. We are divided over politics. Uh, we are divided over face masks. Should we wear it? Should we not wear? <laughs> what kind of mask should we wear? We are divided over the virus. Is there a virus? Is there no virus? You know, there are people who say there's no virus, there's a conspiracy, you know. We are divided about so many things. And, and, and if you don't agree with me, then we say we cannot be connected anymore. And probably, um, you know, I will, I will unlike you from my Facebook page <laughs> because I don't like you. We are not united in this. So, you know what? I'm going to unlike you. I'm going to unfriend you and no more friends. And the, this mentality is, is kind of making the way into, into the church of Christ. The same mentality. But Ephesians, tell, Ephesians tells us that God called us, calls us to, to be one, to be united. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says, Therefore I... 
prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And verse 3, make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you have been called to the one glorious hope for the future. There is, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all in all and living through all. Amen? Everybody says one. one. Everybody says there is power in one. There is power in one. So what is this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this unity Jesus is referring to? You know, unity multiplies power. When people work together, when people bond together, those people are unstoppable. Unity builds. Division destroys. There's no other way around. i never seen unity that can destroy something good. Division is the one that destroys. So... Jesus defines unity as being the, the followers of Jesus, as, as being one, as he and his father are one. This is what it says in John chapter 17. When it says, I pray that they will be one just as we are one, Father. So unity, according to, to Jesus, was, was a unity, united, uh, was a group of, uh, uh, was uh, this Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that were united for a purpose, united for a single goal, united for a vision. And Jesus says, Father, you and I, uh, we, we, uh, we, we agree that, that what matters the most. I agree to come down and complete the work that you gave me. And because of that, you are united in this. Unity has to do with the oneness of purpose. Now, unity is not sameness. Unity is not sameness. It's about distinctives that, 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 that heads in the same direction to achieve a common purpose. Have you ever seen a pretzel? Yeah? Have you ever eaten a pretzel? Yeah? Now, a pretzel has kind of three distinctive holes. Yeah? So kind of the pretzel is pretty much... Uh, I try to make a pretzel myself, but, but I just... Uh, uh, a pretzel has three distinctive holes. Yeah? It's pretty much imagines the same like the Trinity, like the, the three God had, yeah? Three distinctive ro- holes. Um, but all, all of them tie together to make this one great delicious pre- pretzel. So I have this uh, a tiny pretzel that kind of, you know, it's three holes and one big pretzel. Um, and, uh, and all this forms one pretzel that actually is quite good, you know? So, three holes in one. For a purpose, to be delicious, so I can eat it, and you can watch me. I'm eating the second one. Three in one. I can three times another one. God never intended for us to be the same. Unity is about coming to an agreement of what we are called to do. What's missing when there is division is the absence of the common purpose. When you have division, it's because there is no common purpose. And Jesus says that the, the ones of the, of the Godhead was connected to the fact that, that he completed the work the purpose that he was sent for. And in order for that to happen, submission had to take place. Jesus had to be, to be submitted to the Father. Father said, I want, this is the purpose. We're going to save the world, and I want you to go and fulfill that purpose. So Jesus submitted to the Father. When, 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 when Jesus says, I'm going away, the Holy Spirit comes, and what he does, he will point towards me, so he has to be submitted to me. In order that to happen, submission has to take place. Unity cannot happen if you are not submitted and if you choose to have different purpose. In verse 17, it says like this, John 17 verse 17 says, Make them holy 
by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you send me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Now here's the key ingredient of this unity, of the Godhead, is the truth. There is no truth in division. Everyone has to have an opinion these days about everything. That's a problem. Go on social media, on newspapers, on TV. Even if you want it, even if you don't want it, you'll still know it. You're going to find out that everybody has an opinion. And their decision is based on, on their idea of what they think is true. How many, how many of you know the song, the Mambo number no. 5 song? Um, a little bit of Monica on this side, a little bit of Erica on that side, a little bit of Rita, a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of Sandra in the sun, a little bit of that here and that there and here, the, here, there, a little, bit of, a little bit of truth here, a little bit of truth there, a little bit of truth here, a little bit of truth there, and so on. And Jesus says, to be sanctified by whose truth? By your truth. Truth is God's view on everything that matters. And when everyone has his, his own purpose and everyone goes in, in their directions, you cannot have unity. And when you don't have unity, you cannot have the presence of God. Because God says, I only operate in unity. Where there is no unity, God won't show up. Where there is no unity, God not going to come and be present with us. A truth is not truth because you believe it's true. A truth is true because God determines so. Because God says it's the truth. A human truth is, is based on a probability. What you think is true. But God's truth is absolute. I mean, I mean imagine you need to have a surgery. And, 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 and the doctors are, are, are and kind of, you know, you're on the bed there for the surgery. All the slides on you. And the doctor's kind of talking to the nurses. And, 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 and thinking, well, based on what I think I heard, this is what hurts him. This is what he has pain. I think this is the right side where I need to operate. Imagine that. Would you go to that doctor? Well, I think, I think this is the right place, right? Um, I think, based on what I read, maybe this is the place where I need to cut him off. Excuse me, doctor, could you be more specific? <laughs> Are you sure? Just says when, 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 uh, when a watching uh, lost world is, is looking at the body of believers, they, they, they need to see something they cannot find anywhere else. Anywhere else. Oneness, the power of oneness, the power of oneness will, will, bring, will bring something far more than you can imagine. So the question is, where should we be one in? Where should be we united in? I have three points for you today. So if you take notes, I want you to write it down. If you don't take notes, I want you to write it down. Three points for you today. Yeah? Here's, uh, here's what you need to know, where, where we need to be one. Number one. United in prayer. United in prayer. Now there is a story in the Old Testament about the great army that came against the king Jehoshaphat. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and it says like this. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 1 says, After this the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites and some of the Munites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazon Tamar. Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. As, as a church, we, we, we are involved in the battle. And the battle is, is, is a spiritual battle. And, and the battle we are involved is, as a church is between, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. But, but here in the second chronicles, says the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they were united together to seek God through prayer and through fasting. 
The church needs, needs, the church today needs people like Jehoshaphat that, that will lead us into prayer and to seek God. One of the aspects of, of unity in the early church was unity in prayer. Do you remember the, the upper room and the 120 people there? The Bible says in, in Acts chapter 1 that, that they continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. One accord in unity in prayer. And, 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 and sometimes people are telling me, you need to bring people with you. Uh, probably what they, they mean is that let them have their saying or let them decide where they want to go. And this is very unbiblical. God decides where we want to go. But, but in bringing people with us, it means that we ha I have to, to challenge you as a church to get united in prayer. When, when I say bring the people with you, is that we have to come together to be united in prayer and fasting and to seek God's will, to seek God's, God, God's vision for us as a church. Unity in prayer. Bringing people with you is very important to be united in prayer. And, and this is something that the church needs today more than ever before, to be united in prayer. And the church needs to, to cry out to God with one voice, united with one voice, recognize that without power and the presence of the Spirit of God, the church is powerless and ineffective. And it's our job and it's my job as a pastor to bring you united in one voice before God in prayer and fasting. Number two, united in vision and in purpose. There's a story in the Old Testament where the Israelites returning to, from the promised land after 70, 70 years of exiles in Babylon. And, and Zerubbabel came with the first group of exiles and began to rebuild the temple out of the rubbles. And, and, and Ezra came with the second group of exiles and began to, to kind of implement temple worship uh, uh, again. And then we have this guy, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is returning with a third group of people. And they, before they're coming to this, this group uh, 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 in Jerusalem, they are, they, they, are, they are thinking and they are praying because they want to... To, to rebuild a, a city, a wall that was destroyed in fire. And Nehemiah goes to the king and asks to go and to rebuild them. And then he gets the permission and then he leaves. And then we have this text from Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 11. It says like this. So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. This is the third group. I had not only told anyone about the plans God has put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except, ex except the donkey I was riding. And after dark, I went out to the valley gate, past the jackal well, and, and over the dung gate, and inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So through, through it was still dark, and I went to the kingdom valley. Instead, inspecting the wall before, I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city official did not know I had been out there or what I was doing. For I had not yet saying, said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the, Jews, to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administrations. But now I say to them, you know very well what troubles we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and, this, and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at, what? At once. In other words, they replied all together. Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. And then, in verse 20 says, The God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. And so on. So Nehemiah waited three days to see to see if this vision that God has placed onto his heart was, was one that would come about. And then he goes to the others and he tells them the vision. <clears throat> and Nehemiah told the people what he saw. That Jerusalem was, was in ruins and, and, and the wall needs to be fixed. And, and this had to be done so that Jerusalem would not be a, a, a reproach anymore of the, to, to the surrounding uh, countries. Because it was a disgrace for Jerusalem to the surrounding countries. And once it says, once they realize the vision is from God placed upon their heart, Jeremiah says, we have to start to rebuild. We have to have this vision all together so that in unity we can be achieve this uh, rebuilding the walls. 
But here's the thing. Just telling them what the vision was, do you think was enough for them to get on board with it? Just telling them this is the problem, get on board with it. Nehemiah told the people that God was behind it. And the king was behind it. And they needed to rebuild this together, the walls of Jerusalem. The people bought into the vision after, he, they were, after Nehemiah challenged them in joining him. Then the vision became not just Nehemiah's vision, was the vision of all together. Jeremiah presented the vision and said, God is beyond this vision and we have to own this vision together. It's not just Nehemiah's burden, but it has to be all together's burden. We must commit to make God's vision a reality because God is behind us. As he writes chapter 2 in the history of this church, God is behind us. And the vision that we have for this church is not just my vision. It's not just the leader's vision. We have to own the vision. We have to be united in the same vision and the same purpose. Why? Because God is behind this vision. God is behind this purpose. There always going to be, always has been, always going to be opposition. So should we expect that when God places a vision on our hearts, that, that, that there won't be anyone who will come up against us? Certainly not. Because there will always be opposition. And I believe that Nehemiah knew that opposition would be coming in his way. And I know that too. When we start a new vision, there's always going to be opposition. We know that. There are already some people who kind of start opposition. But Jesus says, Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And Jesus is stating here that authority of everything has been given to him. And he says, because of that, and then now go. Go and make disciples for all nations. Go and do what I'm telling you to do. I'm in charge here, says Jesus. And because of that, I'm giving authority to do it. Just as Nehemiah told the opposition against him that, that he was, that was this his land, when a position comes, we have to say, this is our land. We have to take this land in the name of Jesus. So let's make God's vision a reality and go into the world and let's proclaim God's vision, God's love, God's care, God's grace for the people. They need to hear the good news. Sometimes the church is known for what they are against for, but it's now a time the people to know what the church is for, for God's love and God's passion for their lost souls. God do cares for them and we have to stand behind that vision. United in vision and, and, um, and, in, and prayer. And number three, united in faith. We have to be united in faith. And when I'm talking about here faith, I'm not talking about faith as being a religion. I'm talking about faith in we all together, we have to believe. We have to believe that there is something more out there. We have to believe that God has something more for your own life, for you as an individual, for you as a family, for us as a church. We have to believe together. One faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 says like this. Can I have the verse? It says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And verse 13 says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of, our God's, of, of God's Son uh, so that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. One faith. Thomas Paine says, It is not in numbers, but in unity that our great strength lies. J.K. Rowling says, we are only as strong as we are united and as weak as we are divided. We may not always be united in our opinions. We may not be united on our particular topics. But we should always be united in faith for the things that matter. So in conclusion, 
One man with one vision and one dream can do incredible things. One person needs one idea and can happen great things. Look at how many good churches in this world. Look at so many organizations. Look at so many um, um, businesses. Look at so many uh, missional agencies today started because one person had one burden, one vision, one goal, one dream. One person had a vision globally, and today are great things happen throughout the churches and throughout all these organizations. Can you believe that? One person, one dream, many things can happen. Now imagine, imagine when more than one purpose, one person dares to dream. What can happen? If one person can do great things, imagine us dreaming together daring to be united in prayer in vision in purpose in faith i believe not incredible not not great things happen will, will happen but incredible things will happen john barrymore said a man is not old until regrets takes the place of dreams I want to say again, a man is not old until regrets takes the place of dreams. When your regrets begin to outnumber your dreams, that's the day you realize you are getting old. When your past is more excited than your present and your future, then we are in trouble. Because our dreams determine the quality of how we live. And if you live in the past, that will determine the quality of your life now. It was made a research in the, in the church growth development, and it says that, that the younger generation dares to dream more than the older generation. So as we age, it seems like we dream less. Why? Because we have the tendency to look back of what happened, and we cannot enjoy the present and be excited about the future. When you are young, it's still about the present and the future. It's nothing about the, 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 the past. It's all about living in the present, it's all about the great future. I have some friends who, who are called to, to plant churches, and they planted churches in the last five, ten years, and they were so excited in the beginning, so excited about, wow, what's going to happen? We're going to have this church, we're going to plant this church here. It's going to be a great impact in the nation, in the, in the society. And, and I always told them, you know what, I don't, I don't need to, try to plant a church to be excited. I can be excited for a church that is six years old too. Why? Because it's not the age of the church that makes me excited, but the future that God promised for this church that makes me excited. And, and, and you know that why, why we stop dreaming with age? Because we don't want to be part of this future, because maybe we want to be challenged and kind of disturbing our, our, our comfort. If you dare to dream, you are afraid that God will, will, will grant you that dream and it will make your life harder and you don't want to be there. You want, God, bless me at this time, and, and that's, that's enough. That's enough. Just, just, just make me blessed now, and that's enough. And God says, well, you know what? That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you now. And what happens next? We compare. We compare with others. They are, are more blessed, and you think, what happened with them? Well, because they asked for more. And God granted them more. And somehow in our churches today are missing this kind of basic elements that exist in the early church. The early church was, was, was strong, united, like-minded people who loved God in their hearts. And this was evident throughout their testimony. And, and the, the early believer left an example for us to follow. And Jesus prayed for the unity of the church. And the book of Acts is filled with prayers, with, with, with this kind of prayers, fulfilled prayers. If we want to see the power of God manifested in our churches today, if you want to see the power of God manifested in your own life, in your family, we need to be a church that is one accord, a church that is based on, on unity that the Spirit brings into our lives. 
And I believe that the greatest challenge for the church of Jesus Christ today is, is that, that brothers and, and sisters that come from different walks of life dwelling together in unity. People who are coming from all walks of life, transforming by God, living in unity. Now that's powerful. Now that's the church of Christ. The world cannot see God, but they can see us. Because we reflect the image of God into the world. How we live, how we care for others, how we approach others, how we deal with others, how we relate with others. And this is what they see. And I don't want them to portray a God that is full of hate and division and, and, and disagreement. I want to portray a God that is a God of unity and love and care and passionate about his children. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody says the power of one. The power of one. We need to be united in what? In prayer, in vision, and in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come here as we close.